Hello once again my friends, by now hopefully you've watched my spoiler free breakdown of my gameplay session for Indiana Jones and the Great Circle, which goes over every aspect of the gameplay and overall experience. Now in this video we're going to go more in depth about the story and everything I learned from it. I'm going to tag this as a spoiler video, but it's only light spoilers from the early parts of the game. Certainly every step along the journey adds to the overall experience, and it is best to experience it yourself when the game comes out. But if you're like me and are dying for every nugget of information about this game that you can get, you're in the right place. Again, there will only be a few light spoilers from the early game. I played the game for about 2 hours 15 minutes, which included Marshall College and parts of Vatican and Egypt. We also saw a 10 to 15 minute video with footage from throughout the game. And I've been told that a version of that video will be released to the public at some point in the future. I'm going to start with Marshall College and work through the story as I experienced it. So Indy is awoken by the sounds of a break-in while working late in his office at Marshall College. Fast asleep on the couch is Marcus Brody, who is talking in his sleep. He seems to be having a dream about being lost in his own museum, which is a nice touch as he mentions that it's like a maze. Every location has a title card in the classic Euro style font, but it is never the first frame of the location. It usually comes a few seconds or moments later. The intruder seems to have walked down the hall to peek into Indy's office before heading back the other way. What the devil? Indy catches a glimpse of the man's shadow and works his way through the halls to investigate. Damn kids. Someone's getting expelled tonight. He reaches a lobby where he can pick up his faculty ID and a map of the college. Past that, he goes through the front part of the museum to the back section of the museum and approaches Locus. Can't sleep here. Who the hell are you? I was playing on a massive screen, and seeing this cutscene of Locus approaching Indy on it was surreal. I was watching a new Indiana Jones movie. Locus speaks a form of Latin and mentions that Indy talks too much. <laughs> right. You asked for it. They fight. This is a museum! Careful! It's a tough fight, and Locust grabs a chokehold of Indy and knocks him out. If I'm not mistaken, I believe the title card, Indiana Jones and the Great Circle, came up at this point, and I was just soaking it all in. It was a really satisfying introduction, teasing the mystery and the gameplay. He is awoken in the morning by Marcus. Now we get the first puzzle of the game, as two display cabinets are smashed and the artifacts scattered on the floor. So you have to use clues to figure out which artifact goes in which position. I was a bit too hasty in picking up all of these items quickly, but I should have taken more care, because Indy will tell you clues and the game will tell you the name of the relic when you pick it up, and you can't see those a second time. Once everything is back in their place, Indy realizes which artifact is missing. So, is everything back? Not quite. Well, what's missing? SW-003. What was that? Sea Expedition. He took the cat mummy, Marcus. But why? The cat mummy that Indy picked up in Siwa only a few weeks prior. He and Marcus are very concerned. Marcus follows you around as an NPC as you search for more clues to discover the identity of the perpetrator. Indy can stop in the infirmary for a bandage, and I played with the radio there too. I noticed that they had one or two busts of presidents, including Abraham Lincoln. Somewhere in the college is the map to the Temple of the Forbidden Eye that you can pick up, but you don't have to. Also optional is to pick up a newspaper clipping on the black shirts. You can further explore the college if you like, and you can go into Indy's classroom which is pretty much identical to how it looked in Raiders, including the skeleton poster and an apple on the corner of his desk. This kid with his apples. Save that for later. Finish planning your next classes? <sighs> Nearly. I was gonna take my students on a field trip. Get their heads out of books for a while. Go easy on them. 
They have a lot on their plate during midterms. But the game gives you no reason to go there. There are no objectives there. In one of the large rooms, I believe a student lounge, Indy sees the giant's pendant hanging from the broken window. He and Marcus lift a large fallen shelf together, and Indy uses it to climb up there. Outside the broken window, you can see a few gardeners. These are the only other people you see in this section of the game. There are no students or other faculty members. Indy brings the pendant back to his office and consults a book. They discover that it's the symbol of the Vatican treasury. Indy insists that he has to go, but Marcus protests, saying that he is in the middle of the semester. Indy pulls out a suitcase and opens it up. To his surprise, there is a notebook there with a red ribbon. It's the same journal that you get with the collector's edition. Indy says he hasn't opened that suitcase since Cairo last year, referring to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Inside on a sticky note is a note from Marion saying, for your next adventure. Indy throws the note away and doesn't tell Marcus about it. But this journal becomes your journal in the game, that will fill with notes, maps, and so on. Marcus reveals to the player that when Indy returned from Siwa with the cat mummy, Marion was gone. It seems like he went there to get away from her, and now he is once again trying to escape in the same way. All that stuff regarding Marion is emotionally impactful, especially when you open the suitcase and see the journal. I looked around the office and found not one, but two crosses which were very similar looking to the Cross of Coronado, and had the number 1912 on it. No doubt a reference to Last Crusade. There were also drawings of the Chachapoyan Idol, but no sign of the Atlantean statue from Fate of Atlantis. But that makes sense because it never was in his office in that game either. Keep in mind that Indy's office is not the same as the one in Last Crusade, because that was Barnett College and this is Marshall College even though the classrooms are identical. Indy collects various items from his office to take on the adventure and puts them in the suitcase. The giant's pendant, the rhythm and blues gramophone record which he mentions as a gift, his bullwhip, and a picture of the cat mummy which is on a bulletin board in his office. Marcus reluctantly hands Indy his fedora. Indy tells him to schedule one of the other professors to cover his class and mentions two of them but I forgot their names. Indy walks out of his office and the camera zooms in on a map of the northern Atlantic Ocean on the wall, which fades into the map sequence. All next plane to Rome. Stop. Need help. Stop. Meet me in Vatican. Stop. Indy. My friend, stop. Vatican not safe. Stop. We'll wait for you at village steps. Stop. Subtlety is a virtue. Stop. Antonio. We arrive in Vatican at night, and I played the first section here, which is set in and around Castel Sant'Angelo. Indy begins in a secluded area and encounters several guards as he works his way toward the famous mausoleum. You reach a narrow alleyway in the next section and you sneak or fight your way through or take the route overhead. Eventually you use your whip to climb up into the large circular tower of the castel. There's a small courtyard up there with a guard with a dog, and there are several hallways and rooms connecting to it. You have to grab a key from the upstairs room and use it to unlock the gate. You then descend a zip line into another area where you are confronted by another two guards. Just drop the guard. Come here, pal! I'm on. I found it was best to grab bottles or melee weapons and take down guards one by one rather than running ahead, because there was another bad guy at the bottom of the steps. You don't want to get stuck between several enemies. Eventually you cross a stone walkway where you face a single brute guard, but there is a melee weapon there so it was easy to beat him quickly. Another satisfied customer. On the other side of the walkway, your friend Antonio is waiting at the door. Indy, is that you? <laughs> Antonio. We have to make haste. 
I just saw Father Ventura with a black shirt on his way to the castello. Father Ventura? What's that? I said, who is Father Ventura? Uh, we call him the man in black. A friend of Mussolini. Practically runs the Vatican now that the Pope has taken ill. You enter a small dark room. While above you, someone called the Man in Black, aka Father Ventura, is in conversation with someone else. He mentions that guests are coming to the Vatican tomorrow, no doubt referring to Voss and the others. Once they have gone, Indy and Antonio continue on to a more colorful room. By now, it is daytime. Antonio calls Indy Henri, and Indy says, I haven't heard that name in 19 years. That would be 1918, the end of World War I, and probably immediately after the events of Masks of Evil, where Indy arrived first in Venice before traveling to Transylvania to face Vlad the Impaler, basically Dracula. And it's a cool idea that Indy would bond with a priest after that whole ordeal. This is the end of the Marshall College Vatican section of gameplay that we had access to, but the other section of gameplay we had access to was Giza. So by now we've jumped ahead in the story. This is an open world segment, and like I said in the previous video, it is so satisfying to play. It's very evocative of the Tannis Dig portion of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where Indy is conducting his work in secret while tiptoeing around a Nazi dig site. For some reason, Bethesda have sent me footage of the wrong part of Egypt for this video, so you're going to be mostly seeing footage that does not match the gameplay and locations I'm talking about. Indy and Gina get out of a truck, and you control him as you have the option to climb a small hill and get a landscape view of Giza as the location title card comes in. From here, you spot the blue tent, which is your destination. There you meet Dame Nawal Shafiq Barclay, who works for the museum. There are several items in the tent which spark conversations. A picture of an explorer named something like Meredith Murray, and Barclay mentions that she is now at Petra. Barclay has a pet snake, which scares Indy, much to Gina's amusement. Uh, Barclay asks Indy to feed her snake, and Indy seems like he doesn't want to be embarrassed, so he goes ahead and does it in a comical scene, which is uh, cross-cut with a conversation between Gina and Barclay. We learn that Gina's sister is named Laura Lombardi. She seems to be an archaeologist who is seemingly being used or being forced to help the Nazis. There is a picture of Ra on a board, and when Indy takes a look at it, it starts a conversation and they realize that there is a statue of Ra with a stone inside of it just like the Siwa Cat Mummy did. So the objective for Indy is to collect four tablets from various chambers throughout this Giza world. Once he has done that, Barclay can trade them for passes to the German dig site. But before Indy can do that, he's going to need a lighter to get through certain obstacles in those chambers. We were directed by event staff to do this because it is it totally clear in the gameplay that this is what you need to do. So you go to the market and find a vendor with a monkey. Indy can buy the lighter from her and he can take a picture of them and the woman will strike a pose. Indy mentions that the monkey is up to something but I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. You could crack the bullwhip on civilians and they won't react. If you hold whip you can grab hold of them but you can't pull them. Let me mention some side things that you can do here. You find a poster about two French-speaking men disguised as Arabs who have been stealing artifacts. I looked for them very briefly, but I didn't find them. There's also a shack in the middle of the desert with a man trapped inside, and the game says you can find a discarded key somewhere to unlock him, but it didn't seem to be nearby, so I didn't waste time on that either. There is a footlocker in one of the German camp areas with a note saying change the lock because even a child could figure it out. I tried 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and a few other things, but it didn't work, so I pressed on. Also, near the first section, there is a medical tent, and a man has a desk with adventure books. If you search the world and find medicine, you can trade with him for the adventure books. So now it's time to find the four tablets. They are in chambers scattered around the map. These challenges will have you using fire to clear debris, or encountering scorpions, one of them has already been found and placed in a German footlocker with the code written on a note nearby. And for the other tablet, you use a sledgehammer to break through a stone door and then you cross a spiked pit with your whip, but a gate blocks the way on the other side. Looking around, you will find a switch to unlock it. Returning to Barclay, she has you put the tablets in a box below a false bottom and carry it out to a truck. The man standing there will leave the passes to the German dig site on the table. 
By the way, there are three places that you can find a disguise here in Giza. The developers showed us this on the map. I grabbed one from the kind of northwest corner of the map. It was the white outfit Arab disguise from Raiders. I believe you could get the same one from Barclays Tent, but I didn't really look for it. I noticed that it doesn't work in restricted sections and guards will open fire on you and sound the alarm if you show yourself there even with an Arab disguise. You return to Barclay who has you sit down and discuss the plan. The game time jumps to later as you approach the gate to a dig site full of busy Arab workers. Inside you find a spot of red paint on the wall, marking the entrance to a secret tunnel. You smash through with a sledgehammer and explore it with Gina. In one chamber you find an empty pedestal. An adjacent room contains the missing artifact. But the moment you enter, the gate slams behind you. The room is full of scorpions. You can use a torch to usher them away, but you have to drop it to pick up the artifact. The scorpions repopulate the room quickly, so I had trouble accomplishing this without taking damage. You pass the artifact through the gate to Gina, who puts it on the pedestal, opening another passageway. You emerge into the restricted area of the campsite where Voss's office is on top of a large tower. Just as a reminder, the footage here is not of the area that I'm talking about. Before you can head to his office, you first have to lower a Nazi flag. This is the signal for Barclay to begin the diversion, and you hear explosions as many of the Germans go running. So I tried at first to scale the tower by the steps, but it was tough. There were several guards there with guns, and they gang up on you quickly. Gina will help you in the next fight, but bullets are lethal and you can die fast. I wasted a lot of time here and in the next area trying to take a direct approach, and I kept dying. I suggest when you play to take time to study the environment and look for alternate routes. Climbing a small tower will give you access to a zip line, which will at least skip one of the floors of the main tower. Pick off guards one by one as you reach the top, then use a trap door to enter Voss's office. He isn't there. There are several papers with different bits of information. There was one letter from someone named Myrna or Myrna, I think who was apparently a journalist that Voss wanted to write a fluff piece about himself, but she refused. Andy mentioned that he hadn't seen her since the volcano. I'm not sure if this was a reference to a book or something. Uh, maybe one of you guys can let me know again. Uh, another note mentioned a German vessel which mysteriously vanished off the coast of Peru. Gina said battleships don't just disappear, and Indy jokes that it must have hit an iceberg. This is obviously a reference to the cutscene we saw in June, where a ship is found on top of a mountain in the Himalayas. Another note is to Voss from Adolf Hitler, saying that he supports his efforts or something like that. There are several other notes, but I don't remember what the other ones were. Gina tells you to look out the window. Using your camera, you spot Voss entering a building on the other side of the camp. It is decided that you guys have to follow him. I tried to take a direct approach and died many times. I eventually somehow managed to get to the front door, but it didn't let me enter, nor did the side door. I clearly wasted a lot of time here. The solution was the building next to it. First of all, I had to climb a ladder to get on top of it, and I hit a glitch where I got stuck and I had to reset it several times, and they called Jens Anderson to take a look at it, so hopefully that will be fixed uh, for the final game. Eventually, I somehow got through the glitch. You zipline across to the next building, second floor. I think you sneak into a section between the floors. In the floor below you is Voss and his main henchman. You eavesdrop. This image from a previous trailer is from that moment. They are having an argument, and they are clearly at odds with each other. The henchman doesn't think much of Voss and even pulls out a gun threatening to kill him. But Voss is not going to break away and remains defiant and unfazed. This argument pertains to the dead body on the table. It is one of the giants, but not Locus. The henchmen killed him and Voss is pissed because he was their biggest lead. Roughly at this point in my gameplay session, it was announced that our time here was over. However, the very nice gentleman there told me that he would let me continue because there was a great cutscene ahead. Suddenly the ceiling collapses, knocking the henchmen out. Indy comes face to face with Voss for the first time in the game. Gina appears behind Voss and holds him at gunpoint while Indy removes the cover from the dead body's face and looks at I think a pendant on the table as well. Each of these things trigger short cutscenes. Then you pull down a cloth revealing markings on the giant's chest similar to the Allmaker. Indy and Voss debate the origin. Egyptian. Sumerian. 
Now, unless I misheard this next part, somehow Voss knows about Indy's breakup with Marion and taunts him for not wanting to be a father and then for not wanting to be his own father. Voss also suggests to Gina that her sister Laura is not being coerced but is a willing participant in the Nazi scheme. Clearly Voss knows how to get into anyone's head. This provides a distraction for the henchmen to attack them. Indy is about to punch the henchman, but as he throws his arm back, his elbow pops Voss right in the nose, giving the henchman time to knock Indy out. Gina holds the gun on the henchman, but Voss hits her and she falls down as she fires a single shot, which grazes the cheek of the henchman as the bullet strikes a portrait of Hitler on the wall right between the eyes. This distracts the henchman who is totally phased by the image of Hitler with a bullet hole in his forehead. Gina stands up to fire a shot at the henchman but ends up hitting her head on the shelf and passes out. A melee weapon falls down from the shelf into Voss's hands. The henchman turns around and assumes that Voss has knocked Gina out. The henchman is impressed and thanks him for saving his life. We see the dynamic between these two characters shift from their earlier conversation. Voss is happy to take credit. Suddenly Indy reemerges and knocks out both of them in one blow with a chair. This entire cutscene was fantastic. It was funny. It was intense. It was back and forth. It was unpredictable. It was so perfectly Indiana Jones, leaving me very, very excited to see what else this game had in store. And it still wasn't the end of the Egypt section of our gameplay demo, but unfortunately, there was no more time to explore the rest of it. They told me that I was the only person who managed to get this far in the time that we were allotted and we only had about 2 hours 15 minutes to play and I had spent the first few minutes sitting down and talking to Jens Anderson, so everyone else had a good head start on me. By the way, there will be checkpoints whenever you accomplish something and you can restart from the latest checkpoint through the pause menu. Now as I said, we also watched a video with footage from all different parts of the game. It featured the same narration as the behind closed doors video from back in August, but much of the footage was different. I distinctly remember seeing Indy pick up a Chachapoyan urn, but I do not believe it was from the Peru segment. It was from somewhere else. Further strengthening the ties and importance of Raiders of the Lost Ark's opening scene to this game. The video showed a lot of bits that we hadn't seen before. Indy can swim in the game and we see first person swimming. You can also lean in this game like in Goldeneye and many first person shooters. We see the scene where Indy and Gina approach the Sukhothai Pyramid in a boat and then we see a snake fall on Indy and Gina makes a comment about Indy's fear of snakes. There is a cutscene at Vatican in the daytime where Indy is helped out of a pit by a black shirt soldier who suddenly realizes that he is not someone he knows and Indy quickly dispatches him. There was a line mentioning something about the Chimera people during the Sukhothai segment. There's also a glimpse of another NPC ally, perhaps at Sukhothai, a band who Indy explores the temple with. There is also a glimpse of another NPC ally, perhaps at Sukhothai, a man who Indy explores a temple with. We see a scene, I believe set at Sukhothai as well, where Indy platforms across spinning ancient gear platforms. Lots of bits in Vatican that I hadn't seen before. They mentioned that the player has to use their tools in creative ways and they showed a few of them. In Vatican, Indy picks up a torch and holds it in a fiery urn to make it catch fire and uses it to clear debris. They show examples of exploring off the beaten path for side missions. In the Vatican, you can find a secret underground fight club, which has nothing to do with the story. Pretty cool. When they showed the shot of Indy slapping a brute guard, it got a big laugh. There were so many things shown very fast and I couldn't keep track of everything. So I do believe that that is all the information I have for you guys at this time. I know I've repeated this several times, but I really do think this is a phenomenal game. It so brilliantly captures recognizable elements from the films and from Fate of Atlantis. Some parts in particular feel like the exact spirit of Raiders of the Lost Ark has been brought to life. The characters and the acting are thoroughly convincing. Everything from the level design to the controls to the rich story which you uncover one step at a time have been ingeniously crafted. And now I find myself counting the days until I can experience Indiana Jones and the Great Circle again. Feel free to leave any comments or questions for me down below and don't forget to hit like and subscribe to stay up to date on some great content that's on the way.
and do be sure to check out my playlist for Indiana Jones and the Great Circle, which includes all sorts of content from breakdowns to theories to extended gameplay trailers. Till next time, my friends, I wish you all fortune and glory. Bye-bye now.